So uh, today is Saturday, April 9th. Uh, April 8th on the Mahayana calendar is the traditional date of the Buddha's birth 2,500 years ago. So today we have an all-day Zazen Kai in honor of the Buddha's birth, um, which is an historic uh, as well as mythic event, uh, a legendary happening that speaks directly to our own practice. It's not just a story from long ago. Uh, and it's not just a story. Often it's an important story in some ways in Buddhist cultures for children uh, with a ceremony as uh, often connected with Vesak, which is a celebration of the Buddha's life. And often as a real turn towards uh, uh, joyous uh, participation and <coughs> is very accessible to children. However, the story itself has much deeper import than a simple uh, festival of happiness, joy, or uh, a children's event. Um, so uh, let's look at the Buddha's birth from the ground of practice. First, uh, we'll go through the story itself. Uh, so essentially, in the city of Kapilavastu in southern Nepal, Queen Maya, as how the story goes, the wife of King Suddhodana had a marvelous dream. In her dream, a six-tusked white elephant touched her right side with a lotus flower. Uh, she awoke in joy and told the king. He gathered his wise men, who said that the dream meant that a child would soon be born to them, and that this child uh, was unique. That is, if he could be kept from seeing the painful facts of impermanence, birth, aging, sickness, death, and such, then uh, that child could rise to the position of a world ruler, an emperor of the world. Uh, the king liked that idea very much. Uh, he was a king and he really hoped his son would be even greater, a greater king than he himself, which is understandable. However, the wise men said, if the child uh, took in the reality of impermanence, uh, something we all struggle with. We've all taken it in. Then he would not be drawn to uh, commitment to the events of the world uh, and uh, leadership in that territory, but would uh, really uh, commit himself to the deepest realization of the potential of the human mind itself to understand and to be a benefit to all. In other words, he would uh, become uh, an awakened, fully awakened being or Buddha, uh, which is simply what Buddha means, awakened, an awakened one. So <clears throat> the king was overjoyed and he was troubled. Uh, how would he be able to keep his child from seeing impermanence was his underlying challenge, even before the child was born. Now, <clears throat> the story goes that towards the end of the queen's pregnancy, she set out for the uh, ancestral home of her family, which was kind of a tradition of the time to give birth in the home of your ancestors and the realm of your ancestors. And on the way to her parents' uh, home, she uh, stopped at the beautiful Lumbini Gardens and while standing under a, a sala tree, uh, uh, she reached up to take one of the blossoms and blossoms began raining down from the skies. Now we enter the world of myth and uh, beautiful voices were heard singing and uh, the baby Buddha emerged painlessly, uh, this is myth and legend, from her right side took seven steps, lotus flowers opening beneath his feet. Uh, devas, gods, beings of higher realms were coming down from the skies, pouring heavenly nectar over him, washing all the birth impurities away. And then raising one hand to the heavens and pointing the other down toward the earth, he proclaimed above the heavens, below the heavens, I alone, the honored one. In this life, I shall be Buddha. 
Uh, it said that at that moment, uh, all suffering beings momentarily experienced freedom, joy, and peace. Prisoners, captives, and exiles found release. The fires of the hells ceased to burn. Hungry ghosts were momentarily actually satisfied. Animals freed of fear. Warring spirits stopped battling one another. And happiness suffused all beings. Uh, however, no one was happier than Queen Maya, seeing her long-awaited child at last, unless it was the newborn baby Buddha himself, who already looked upon each deva, person, animal, tree, flower, and stone with the eye of a mother who regards their only uh, well-beloved child. So that's the story. This is the essence of the Buddhist tradition's legend of the Buddha's birth, and it uses the language of myth to point us beyond the literal. Um, we might say, if you want to unpack the essence of the myth, uh, to see how myth works, you might say, here's a, here's, uh, a teaching uh, right here. The uh, baby Buddha is born and uh, raises one hand to the heavens and uh, the points down to the earth and above the heavens, below the heavens, I alone, the honored one. Uh, the reality that this points to is that when anyone truly experiences I alone, the honored one, above the heavens, below the heavens, when everything falls away, all self-centeredness, all thoughts of self and other fall away in the mind, uh, is realized just as it is, this is the birth of Buddha. So the legend creates this kind of roundabout sense uh, that's a nice story, but really is pointing to an essential fact. With realization, a Buddha is born. And this is the possibility and potential of each human being, each living being, to realize his or her own nature. Uh, this nature that is not his or her, uh, this nature that sees with the eyes, hears with the ears, thinks with the brain. Uh, what is this nature? Above the heavens, below the heavens, I alone, the honored one. This is the birth of the Buddha. And presented in the language of myth, we get this lovely story. But there's something there that pertains uh, to this very moment. So, to go back into the story of the birth of the child, the birth of any child is totally ordinary. And at the same time, it's a total miracle, isn't it? I mean, how do two cells become a living person? How do gastral and blastula become a being with talents, interests, features, personality? Where does a child come from? The birth of any one child affects us all, whether we know it or not. Myth gives imaginative space to the uncanny, ordinary reality we are all actually living. Still, in reality, of course, babies don't talk. The baby Buddha's profound utterance above the heavens, below the heavens, can't be taken literally. Fundamentalism's reductive literalization of myth takes us down a rigid road. So far, no Buddhist sects have sprung up arguing over what the baby Buddha said or how many steps he took, and let's hope they never do. That would be a disaster. Still, we humans have been sadly willing to cling to beloved untruths and make mountains of anthills. But Zen begins with the sense that our current story might at least be, if not untrue, then inadequate. Roshi Kaplow used to say that to practice uh, Zen, there's not much we need to believe except that 2,500 years ago, the Buddha was neither a fool nor a liar when upon his great enlightenment, he ex spontaneously exclaimed, wonder of wonders, all beings are Buddha, fully endowed with wisdom and virtue. Only their self-centered or self-oriented delusive thinking prevents them from realizing this. So if we don't need to literally believe that the Buddha spoke as a newborn or that flowers rained down upon him from the skies, or he took uh, 
seven steps, does that mean we should get rid of myth? No. There is truth in all these mythic elements. Uh, and while Zen practice offers us uh, the opportunity to mature beyond beliefs and realize original nature or unconditioned truth for ourselves, the way of the bodhisattva, the way of the wisdom being or being growing up beyond limiting self-centered delusive thinking must still begin with belief, with some basic faith that there is something beyond, yet not separate from the senses and intellect, and that it can be realized, woken to. It is already ours, so we can't gain it, but we can wake to it by allowing the delusive thinking to fall away. How? How does that happen? By focusing on the practice, not simply by thinking about the practice, but by practicing the practice. The mind becomes absorbed in one thing, which means there's no room for all this other stuff. We don't suppress it. We don't try and get rid of it. It just dwindles away. Then what's there? Anyway, that belief is where we begin, but it still takes the work of practicing to wake to the reality that the belief points to. Now, while this sounds relatively easy and simple, hey, we're all Buddhas. All we have to do is realize it. It does not typically come easily. Fairy tales remind us that we may have to eat seven iron loaves and wear out seven pairs of iron shoes before we arrive at fulfillment. This is not simply advice for children. Persistence is the essence of the hero or heroine's journey. Persistence in Zen practice embodies our faith that the Buddha wasn't a fool or a liar when he spoke of our birthright. He wasn't talking about something unique to Buddhists. Rather, he was telling us that there is something worth realizing at the core of this very life. And while we may have each caught glimpses of it now and then in childhood or as adults, formal practice can make its more complete realization truly accessible and possible for each one of us to our own degree. The legendary words of the Buddha above the heavens, below the heavens, I alone, the only one, can of course be badly misunderstood. They do not present overwhelming egotism or narcissism. They actually show the opposite, expressing uh, absolute humility and selflessness. A note to the classic Zen text, Blue Cliff Record says, an ancient said, a sage has no self, but there is nothing that is not his or her self above the heavens, below the heavens, I alone, the honored one. The sage has no self, but there is nothing that is not his or herself. Through the legendary words, in original enlightenment is given voice. While legend asserts that the Buddha knew this truth at birth, history reminds us that the baby Buddha still had to grow up and become Prince Siddhartha, who heartsick over his firsthand experience of old age, sickness, and death, had to struggle to finally, fully, and consciously realize what he had already understood at the moment of birth. Are we any different? There's a Jewish legend that says that every child in the womb already knows all wisdom, all truth. 
Then at birth, an angel touches the child's upper lip with its finger, leaving that little indentation below the nose. That's the mark of the angel's finger. And with that, the child forgets all it knew, all that wisdom, all that insight, all that truth that's already ours, the child forgets. Then our life's work is the work of overcoming that angelic touch and remembering what we once already knew. This is the work of making innate wisdom conscious and mature. This is the work of ongoing practice. Zen master Ikkyu wrote, when I tried to remember, I always forgot. Once I forgot, I never forget. With the, uh, we might say, this is right recollection. This forgetting is true remembering uh, in a nutshell. With the, self with the self preoccupied self totally forgotten, what we've been seeking is already here. We don't have to add a thing. With self-centeredness dropped away, we are home, above the heavens, below the heavens. It is a great relief, a great relief, like a huge weight taken off our shoulders. We are home. We can relax into this life. It doesn't mean that we then stop practicing. It means that we practice with much greater, um, in some ways, commitment. Uh, uh, it's a new beginning. The last lines of the Lord of the Rings, I think, touch us so deeply because they remind us of something we all know, something universal. It goes like this. Sam returns from seeing Frodo and Gandalf off at the gray heavens. And here's Tolkien's final line lines and he went on and there was a yellow light and a fire within and the evening meal was ready and he was expected and rose drew him in and set him in his chair and put little eleanor upon his lap he drew a breath well i'm back he said and that's the end of the Lord of the Rings. I'm back. I'm home. The point of the journey is not to end up in some esoteric place, but to come fully home. How do we do it? Zen practice says by absorbing ourselves in the count of the breath, in becoming aware of the breath and the exhale, exhale the way out by absorbing ourselves in the koan in its question in short by practicing this is how the self is forgotten and as we do as we forget ourselves in absorbing ourselves in the practice the world of the 10,000 unique and individual things steps in and it is as if we have been born anew. A baby Buddha is born. Yet the Buddha's birth is a mystery. And presenting it as miraculous has a truth. Where does a person who is the first to do what's never been done, someone whose efforts ultimately influence millions of lives for the good, come from? Buddhist tradition says that the birth of the child Siddhartha Gautama was the first time in our world cycle that original realization found its voice. Buddhist tradition holds that there were past Buddhas on earth before him, and there will be future Buddhas after him. The baby Buddha, after proclaiming his selfless truth, laps back into infantile smiles, tears, gurgles, laughs, and coos. When grown, as Prince Siddhartha, after seeing signs of impermanence, he gave up his throne and set off into the wilderness and forests of forests and mountains to fulfill his deeper calling. In his complete enlightenment, 
all potential powers of the mind for wisdom and compassion were tradition holds opened and fulfilled. And amazingly, he did this on his own. Though he had several teachers at the start, he came to feel that they did not go far enough and so rather quickly moved on alone. His effort arose out of a determination, a deep determination, a personal determination to benefit all beings. It arose out of the conviction that there was something more beyond the senses and intellect, yet not separate from them. It arose out of dedication to the reality, not just the possibility of awakening. It arose out of dismay and disillusionment and out of grievous pain caused by errors and failures. And it arose out of lifetimes of previous effort as dramatized in the Jataka tales. Knowing from our own practice how hard it is to catch even a glimpse of realization, Prince Siddhartha's ability to accomplish the path entirely, in its entirety, alone, is not simply extraordinary, it is miraculous. His birth is cause for celebration. A tremendous amount of hard work was still needed before what was already in place for him was actually mature. Yet the essence was already there, fully established with above the heavens, below the heavens. This above the heavens, below the heavens is not simply some Eastern thing. The 17th century English Christian theologian and mystic Thomas Traherne, speaking of his own childhood in his uh, compilation called The Centuries or Centuries of Meditation, in the third century wrote, the corn was orient and immortal wheat which never should be reaped, nor was ever sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. The dust and stones of the street were as precious as gold. The gates were at first the end of the world. The green trees, when I saw them first through one of the gates transported and ravished me, their sweetness and unusual beauty made my heart heart to leap, and almost mad with ecstasy, they were such strange and wonderful things. The men, oh, what venerable and reverend creatures did the aged seem, immortal cherubim, and young men glittering and sparkling angels and made strange seraphic pieces of life and beauty, boys and girls tumbling in the street and playing were moving jewels, I knew not that they were born or should die, but all things abided eternally as they were in their proper places. Eternity was manifest in the light of day and something infinite behind everything appeared which talked with my expectation and moved my desire. The city seemed to stand in Eden or to be built in heaven. The streets were mine. The temple was mine. The people were mine. Their clothes and gold and silver were mine, as much as their sparkling eyes, fair skins, and ruddy faces. The skies were mine, and so were the sun, and moon and stars and all the world was mine. And I the only spectator and enjoyer of it. I knew no churlish boundaries, nor properties, nor divisions, but all properties and divisions were mine, all treasures and the possessors of them. So that with much ado, I was corrupted and made to learn the dirty devices of this world which now I unlearn and become, as it were, a little child again. Above the heavens, below the heavens, I alone, the honored one.
with this realization, this is how Buddhas are born. Buddha's birth in the story led to a practice, practice he uncovered and shared by which we ourselves can confirm the reality of Traherne's stunning words. We can experience, realize above the heavens, below the heavens ourselves. So each year on or around April 8th, we take a little time out of our busy schedules to honor the birth of Shakyamuni Buddha. We're grateful for the possibilities his efforts opened for us. But before we are lost in sentimentality, there's this from Master Yun Men. Yun Men, now this is from John Wu's The Golden Age of Zen, which is a, a nice little book. Uh, Roshi Kapo used to read from it all the time. Um, it, and this is a quote from John Wu. Yun Men related the legend that the Buddha immediately after his birth with one hand pointing to heaven and the other pointing to earth, walked around in seven steps, looked at the four quarters and declared above heaven and below heaven, I alone am the honored one. Uh, after relating the story, Yun Men said, if I were a witness of this scene, I would have knocked him to death at a single stroke and given his flesh to the dogs for food. This would have been some contribution to the peace and harmony of the world. So, uh, Roshi Kaplow loved this quote, which reminds us that we don't need fantastic legends and images, wonderful as they are, for they too can bind us down and trip us up. When we throw them away, we find that the Buddha was simply a person who deeply troubled by impermanence and deeply aspiring to be of benefit to all, put his life on the line to realize truth and open a path for others to it. Yun Men, 1500 years after the Buddha and a thousand years before us, wanted to be like the Buddha and actually awake wanted us to be like the Buddha and actually awake, not remain trapped by signs and wonders. While myth suggests vast realities, the word myth itself has been popularly degraded to mean untruth, perhaps due to a half-baked understanding that myth is not literal. Of course it's not, but that doesn't mean it's false. That would be a failure to understand that properly regarded, myth leads us up to the door that Zen practice flings open wide, even as it speaks back from the other side of that gateless gate. All our Dharma ancestors, men and women, who troubled by impermanence and injustice had faith that there was something more encouraged us to keep going. The way extends so endlessly that even Shakyamuni, the fully realized Buddha is, according to Buddhist tradition itself, only halfway there. This is quite stunning. Yasutani Roshi puts this uh, rather dramatically in the Three Pillars of Zen, stating that we fancy ourselves to be the crown of creation, the human beings. Yet in the Buddhist view, we're only halfway between an amoeba and a full Buddha. These are sobering words and anyone who thinks they've gotten it and has gone far enough might want to reconsider. Yun Men's response was his unique way of honoring the Buddha. His way of making sure that we would honor the Buddha with practice, realization, not mere belief. His words are an antidote to fundamentalism. Yet to simply imitate Yun Men's iconoclastic Zen will also lead us astray. Using harsh words, shouts, and blows because Yun Men and others did so is not necessarily Zen at all, but only a kind of imitated, imitative rather, 
uh, wild fox slobber, a self-indulgent sort of poison. In our Buddha's birth ceremony, which will be at 3.30 uh, today, at the end of the Zazen Kai, and by the way, everyone's invited, if you are only here for the morning, have space in your schedule, you're welcome to return. This includes family members and children are welcome to join you uh, to return for the Buddha's birth ceremony at 3.30. Uh, in the ceremony, we will honor the Buddha tenderly and traditionally with respect for the mythic import of his legend. Raising a spoon of sweet tea, we pour it over our baby Buddha, anointing and cleansing him just like those birth attending gods, the Shining Devas did 2,500 years ago. And it has another purpose as well. In washing the baby Buddha free of grime, we wash our own minds free of greed anger, ignorance. This too is how a baby Buddha gets born. In 2016, when Rose and I uh, and others, uh, we, along with Sunyana Roshi, Sunyana Graf Roshi, and the students of the Vermont Zen Center, Toronto Zen Center, and Casa Zen, Costa, Costa, uh, Costa Rica, visited Ensuji, the training temple of the Zen poet and priest, Ryokan, <clears throat> uh, his dates are uh, 1758 to 1831. We found a baby Buddha with one hand raised to the heavens, one pointed down to the earth, standing on the altar. Though in Japan on that pilgrimage, we had seen Buddhas uh, big as houses, uh, glorious and golden. At Ryokan's place, the baby Buddha was about the same size as the little wooden Buddha on our altar. Uh, here now uh, at Endless Path Zendo, maybe six or eight inches high. And it was even less impressive than ours as it was cast in dull black metal. It was quite humble, uh, quite touching to see it. And yet it stands out to me as one of the real highlights of that pilgrimage. Practicing realization, is how a Buddha is born. The story of the Buddha's birth might be based, based on history or not. Regardless, it remains uh, a solid metaphor of our own potential. This very uh, count, this very breath, this very koan, can be our own entrance into the Limbini Gardens, which is in reality, this whole living earth. So uh, baby Buddhas awake and rejoice. <laughs>